Happy Friday. I hope you've had a great week thus far. And welcome to this webinar where we're going to be looking at pretty cool stuff on the visualization part for roads, rails, bridges, and tunnels. Before we start, of course, uh, always get this question, is the webinars recorded? Where can I access it? We have a Baker Bain's YouTube channel where all of our virtual and online events are uploaded, including this webinar. So you are welcome to subscribe, like, share. You know the draw by now. So it's cool that you subscribe because as soon as the recording has been uploaded, you will get a push notification and you can always watch it in your spare time. So just to bear that in mind, join us and you can always learn from all of our technical specialists here. So on the topic at hand, uh, just some background in terms of how this became to be. So we have previously had webinars under the title of Win More Bids and speaking to you on LinkedIn and various other platforms, there was a big demand in terms of visualization. How would you get across technical information in a 3D rich manner so that people that are non-technical can actually grasp what you're designing? And here we are, we've created a two-part webinar series focusing on that, especially on the civil infrastructure components of roads, rails, bridges, and tunnels. Like I said, it is pitching and visualization. We're not gonna go into the detailed design of it. I have covered this in my previous webinars and of course they are on our YouTube channel. So today we're gonna to be looking at road and rail specifically. And in terms of the technologies that we're gonna to be touching on in the series, the main or core technology is going to be Autodesk InfraWorks. It is the visualization tool, uh, the platform to use for all civil infrastructure projects, and you're going to see why in a short while. And just to give you some understanding on how to link it to detailed design, I will touch on Civil 3D Inventor as well as Revit in part two. So definitely catch the second one, and you're going to see this one's going to leave you lingering to attend part two. Of course, I will be your host for this webinar. I am Shuei Yunus. I'm the BIM Technical Specialist for Civil Infrastructure and Mining here at Baker Bains in South Africa. I am a Civil Design Consultant and Autodesk Certified Instructor, as well as a Champion of BIM for Civil Infrastructure here in South Africa, Africa and abroad. So anything Civil Infrastructure Design and Scan to BIM, I'm your guy. You can always reach out to me on LinkedIn or via email. I will have my contacts at the end of the webinar, so you can always reach me then. And of course, if you have any questions during the webinar, please jot them into the chat box. We will definitely tackle them at the end during the Q&A. In terms of us as Baker Baines, we specialize in a variety of things, as you can see here on the snapshot. The biggest segment is that in red being the business process and consulting. We do a lot of consulting with civil infrastructure firms uh, in the AC construction space, so architecture, engineering, and construction, as well as process plant or product design and manufacturing. Just to take you through what we do, uh, scan to BIM. Uh, we partner with two really, really cool brands. So Topcon, if you are on the civil side of things, so if you're on the construction side, we got the GLS 2000 for mass data capture, really, really powerful, rugged, as well as used in mining applications. And if you're more in the interior space or buildings, architectural space, we've got the Leica BRK360, very, very popular, used quite a bit in the build segment, and it makes your work that much easier to capture. If you're looking at more other technologies, we've got IDAS, standing for Infrastructure Design Automation Suite. It is a definite must for any civil infrastructure designer, civil engineer, working with roads and pipe networks. It gives you that extra boost in a BIM application process. I have had this quite a bit from my water professionals that, or pipe network professionals, that there's not really a defined tool. IDAS is your answer, 100%. It works it directly into civil 3D. And it has all of our South African popularly used catalog contents built in. So if you're using Rockla, Tequini, all of those type of things, it is already built in there. Uh, KH3D is in correlation with scan to BIM. It extracts your model, giving you a CAD type of uh, output. So if you're working with Revit or AutoCAD or Plant3D, you can extract it from the 
point cloud and it saves you up to 70 to 75 percent of the modeling phase really really impressive uh, from our credentials points of things uh, we are a consulting company uh, primarily we are an auto service provider select partner we are listed on the marketplace we are accredited consulting implementation framework and of course we are be level two last but not least we do offer training in this case or this time we are doing it virtually of course online so if there's anything that you need help with or you want to investigate reach out to us we are an accredited auto desk training center Last but not least, CAD learning. Uh, as a designer, you have to keep evolving and keep progressing in terms of the complexity of projects and innovation that's required of us. CAD learning is your backbone for that. It has over 50 plus of the Autodesk uh, applications on there, step-by-step -step videos, tutorials. So whether you want to learn Civil 3D, Plan 3D, Inventor, Revit, InfraWorks, vehicle tracking, I mean, they all are on there, step-by-step -step videos, and you can also test yourself after to see how well you've done. So that's a little bit about ICPEC events very quickly. Let's jump into today's session. So we can always start off with industry, industry perspective. I like to paint a picture and set the context for the webinar or any topic that I'm doing. And then we jump directly into the demo where we can look at those aspects of road and rail. Last but not least, we're going to close off, we're going to give you the key takeaways, how we can help you, and very importantly, the Q&A. We'd really like to hear from you, your comments, uh, your questions, anything that's uh, tickling your fancy or anything that you need clarity on. Please shoot it away in the chat box. I will definitely get to it at the end. Okay, so industry's perspective. What challenges are currently faced by professionals when pitching for projects? So I've listed them or compiled them into four main points. The first one being model complexity, getting the vision and design intent across to non-technical members. I have heard this quite a lot over the past year or two, if not more, from a lot of civil consultants that we've got the technical design done, but we're not just getting sign off because we can't convey the message in a clear way. Very, very important. And of course, with the rise in population urbanization, things are getting much more complex. Model aggregation, meaning that you have all the data, but you don't know how to compile it. It's really, really tough, and arriving to one model of truth can be very, very tricky. Model realism, I mean, everyone wants to be cool and innovative, whether you're looking at reality capture, whether you're looking at immersive design, virtual reality, those type of things. There is a lack of visual perspective, so people cannot make informed decisions. And last but not least, it's model flexibility. Generally, depending on the workflows that you're using, the technologies that you're using, your model can be very, very rigid, meaning that you can't really edit, chop and change and make it that collaborative. It's a very big challenge faced in the industry, and you would want to maintain what we call a dynamic nature, meaning that if elements of the model are updated, be it from the architect, from the structural engineer, civil engineer, electrical, MEP, you need it to reflect the actual realistic latest version. These are very, very big challenges. One consulting company, there are many out there, but here back home in South Africa was HHG Consulting Engineers that actually did this. They were tasked to upgrade a BRC system, the rear via here in uh, Stanton was a BRT project standing for bus rapid transport system. And what was very, very complex was they had a very retaining wall as well as a varying platform or median as which the architectural stations needed to sit correctly. And this is what we ended up with. Now, look at this, comparing this to your normal 2D designs to get public approval or sign off, this gets the message across quite clearly so we worked with them together with them and generally that median that you're seeing in the center so let me just hop it there quickly here it's not as flat as it's supposed to be per the technical uh, uh, spec so what we did was we reviewed the model we upgraded or updated the alignment or profile that it needed to follow and the final results you could actually check it out on the Autodesk customer success stories and you can actually read from the team themselves how the, how the challenges were overcome. So just to show you that it's not 
an overseas thing. It's actually applied here back home in South Africa, and a lot of people are wielding the advantages of it. Okay, so let's jump right into things for pitching for roads, rail, bridges, and tunnels, part one. So I have created a project brief. As you know, all of my webinars are very realistic to consulting, which is my background. We have been pitched to, in, to pitch for an infrastructure project. Right? And what's happening is we need to propose two options. The first one being a roadway, second one being a railway. So possibly if the rail looks quite good and depending on cost or whatever, either option might be viable. So we will create these in one model. Now, generally what happens is if you're gonna be doing design options, most consultants don't have the capacity to do it because you have to create two separate models or you might have to copy one, delete those elements, you know, all of those uh, workarounds, which is quite time consuming. What if you could create one model and create options within the same model. That's exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, and of course, we're gonna to need to showcase this design. So today I'm gonna to show you how you can create the model snapshots from it. Part two might be much more exciting. I'm not gonna give anything away or too much away at the moment, but you definitely can have a look at it. And of course, I've taken a place here back home in Western Cape, South Africa. We've got the start point of the road defined by the yellow pin and the end point being the green pin. And as you can see, we've got literally a mountain in the center, so we're gonna make it quite interesting. So let's start off with the first being applying the road corridor optimization tool. Now let's have a look. So this is in InfoWorks. Now this is the model, already I'm winning because I've got a 3D model that's quite realistic. As you can see, we've got the start pin in the yellow and we've got the green or end point right there. Now we can also toggle to the engineering view. So just to show you, I'm not uh, lying to you, there is terrain data already in this model. So pretty, pretty cool. Now, generally the workflow is to create a proposal, what you're seeing here, where you do not want to override the master model as we call it. So we could give it a name, for example, option robot one, and we could also create a second one. Now it will take a few seconds just to load, depending on the size of your model, it could be longer, it could be faster. So you can see already it has saying option one, roadway. So we're gonna create another one because we are tasked with two options, the second one being a railway. So we could just say option two, underscore, and we could give it a name. And we hit okay. Now generally this is the best practice to work in InfoX. So if you haven't known this, now you do. But what's cool with the function we're gonna use next is that it automatically creates a proposal for you. But just to show you best practices, I thought it will be quite handy. Okay, so here we are and we are ready to go from there to there. Okay, so now that we have our proposals done, we are gonna to go to the optimization tool. Now, this is a really, really awesome tool from a design perspective. We can set the road speed to whatever we'd like. I'm gonna stick with 80. We can give it a description. And as you can see, we can also tell the software to insert bridges and tunnels for us, depending on the formatting. So let's make this a bit bigger. So if we wanted to change the lane configuration, these are pre-built in, InfraWorks, they are parametric. So for example, we've got a four lane divided there with, with a, a retainer in the center or a barrier. And you can see there are various options that you can select from. So I'm gonna go for a four lane configuration rather than the two. It's gonna make things a bit more interesting. And I'm just showing you that there is a lot of out of the box functionality that you can use. So here we are, we've got four lanes. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define my start and end point. So I'm gonna click somewhere close, so if not, I could zoom in and just toggle those points uh, really. I'm gonna define the end point. And as you can see, uh, the software is already picking that up. A key tip here is to always zoom in. I mean, from AutoCAD days, we all know that you really have to zoom in. As you can see, it's not aligned to my correct 
position. Of course, I can enter the exact X and Y coordinates if needed. And let's just go and check the endpoint if it is sitting in the correct uh, location. So let's just scroll a little bit here. And as you can see, it's a little bit off. So I'm just going to snap it maybe somewhere there. And as you can see below, I can actually insert intermediate PI points, meaning that I could give it a more structure or more control type of output, depending on what I feel it should be constraining to. Okay. In this case, I'm going to make it do all the work. <laughs> and I'm going to say, okay, I give you the start and end points. You can see it has picked up path one there. Uh, you can see in the job description. And I can go and add further parameters if needed. I'm keeping this very simple. So as you can see here, if there was avoidance zones, meaning that if there's any areas that you need to avoid, we could define them. Uh, there is construction rules as well that we can actually toggle if needed. Uh, let's have a look at them. You can create some cut and fill parameters. You can insert minimum, minimum radii if needed, maximum grades. And of course, you can add construction costs depending. Now, I'm keeping this very simple because I'm putting myself in a first time user's seat. And all I've got to do is hit optimize. Now, this can take a, a few seconds or so, or a bit of time, depending on the length of your own complexity of your model. But this happens in the background. So once it does optimize, uh, it will go to your job monitor and you can continue working as you would like. Now, what happens if they are avoidance zones? So just to explain it, sometimes you might need to avoid a wetlands or depending on your EIA report, you might need to avoid some heritage zones or certain things like that. Now, if you have GIS data, you could actually bring that in pretty good and it will actually put in those zonings for you. So another key important fact or advantage of InfoWorks, you can bring in GIS data. Okay, if you don't have it, you can actually uh, sketch it out quite easily and I'm going to show you how we do that. So let's look at incorporating avoidance zones. So let's go and click in here. So the first part we did had no avoidance zones for the corridor optimization tool. I am going to edit this and I'm going to just type in the word avoidance. Now We've got that. Again, you can see the suitability maps can be imported if needed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the avoidance zone here. So let's say I'm going to add it into an area that I wouldn't like the road to be positioned. Right. So I don't know this site quite well. I've created it for, the mod, for this webinar. And I'm just going to define a random area that I don't want the road to traverse to. So let's say the Right, so I've just drawn a polygon, and as you can see, it has created that avoidance zone called avoidance zone one. We can incorporate a cost if needed. I'm not going to do that. Uh, there's a lot you can do here, as you can see. And just to think that it's a conceptual design tool is quite mind blowing. Of course, you can edit the groups if needed, if it's not exactly where you want, but I'm going to leave it as is, and I can hit optimize. Now, I want you to pay attention here that I am doing it on the same model that has already optimized for the first one. So the first option was we optimize it without an avoidance zone. Option two, which is the one you're seeing right now, is with an avoidance zone. Because I've had a lot of questions about this, uh, particularly from my GIS webinar previously. Now, once the current optimization is done in the background, you will get an email notification to say, hey, what's up? There is your results. Now you can see on these two screenshots, there is a PDF report attached to each of them. So please don't forget that it is there. And on the left, we've got the one without the avoidance zones. On the right, it's with the avoidance zone. So I did two separate scenarios so you could actually see the power that you have. So let's have a look at the first result, which is without an avoidance zone. So here we are. Let's open up that PDF to have a look and see what is going on here. Now, this is quite a comprehensive report. So the more data and the more time that you spend uh, filling out those meta fields that I've shown you previously, 
the more you will have on this report. As you can see, it gives you a lot of tools, cut and fill, the positioning, those type of things, even the changes, all of that. And it even gives you an overview of the route that it took. Now let's go and have a look at it. This is the job monitor that's built into InfraWorks. And as you can see, I've got the green tick in the status bar to show that the analysis is complete. Now, all I've got to do is click on download. As you can see, it's going to create a separate proposal. So it allows you uh, not to override what you currently have. It's a very, very handy tool, right? So I'm just going to probably rename this so I can actually leave it like that. Uh, but let's just be a bit tidy. All right, so let's say road corridor. Uh, let's be a bit more descriptive. Uh, let's say without avoidance. So we can clearly see how the avoidance makes an impact. So let's hit OK. We'll give it a few seconds or so to generate that proposal for us. And as you can see on the top right, it already has updated. So I can probably close this, or move it to one side. And let's just refresh the model so that it can create that proposal for us. As you can see in the background, something has happened. Again, I reiterate, the bigger your model, little, the little bit longer this will take. And as you can see, that proposal has been created for us automatically. Now let's switch to a conceptual view. And let's go and see what has been created. Now, intentionally, I have left a few areas here to give you some heads up. As you can see, it has plotted the road for me, and it's quite deep down, somewhere that I don't like it to be. But let's go have a look and see what's going on along the route. So here we are. It has picked out a best path, taking into analysis the terrain itself. And you can see the route is carried on right to our endpoint. So let's just toggle this a little bit. Zoom in, in and out a bit. Uh, let's go here. You can see it actually inserted a bridge for me. Now, if you don't want this to happen, you can always toggle off the bridge function and you'll just have the road. Uh, and you can actually go and insert that manually. So heads up in part two, we're definitely going to do that. So I'm going to clean up this model, delete the bridges, and we can insert it as we like. So this is how it has automatically created the road for us based on the parameters and also considering the terrain. Now let's look at the result with an avoidance. Now you're probably thinking that the avoidance area is on the top and it's not going to be really effective on this analysis. You're quite right. I have actually done a second avoidance, which you're going to see after this. So let's have a look at the one we had created in red. Again, same procedure. I will receive an email to say, hey, what's up? This is what we have. And as you can see, the image is quite self-explanatory. It has considered our, our road, avoiding that area, and you would get the same type of a report. Okay, so all of that is on here. Now, what we can do, just to zoom in, you can see that it has notified that, but we've got two parts on there. Now, I've intentionally done this because this is a common mistake that's normally made by users starting off with InfoX. So let's go ahead and check out the result. Again, exact same process. We'll download that file, wait for it to update. It will create a proposal for me. I will just say yes, and I will give it a name. So let's keep it quite simple. So we will say probably road width and avoidance zone, right? So road corridor, you can't have spaces in the name. So that's why we generally keep them together or we have an underscore. So with avoidance, so we can say clearly what is the difference. So let's give it a few seconds. So it will start refreshing. Again, this can take uh, a few seconds, maybe a minute or so, depending on the complexity, and I can close this. Now, let's have a zoom in here. Now, if you see here, the reason why you've got two parts is we ran the optimization on the first model. So it avoided the initial optimization route that we gave. And the reason why it's down there, it considered the dirt road that's going across and it snapped to it automatically. So if you see anything weird, it's not that the analysis was incorrect, 
it was rather more comprehensive than you think. So if you didn't want it to snap to that road, you could have probably delete that road in your conceptual design, or you can actually edit the long section uh, that you can edit the VPIs and so on like that. So if you wanted to go and check that out, all you got to do is select the road and you can go to the view profile option. Okay, you can see all of the data is aligned to what we wanted. We can still edit it if needed. All right, and that's it. Okay, so it can actually accommodate avoidance zones. I'm going to make things more interesting and I'm going to put it more on like directly on the path of the road just now. So let's just see how it matched up. So as you can see here, it did tie into the point that we wanted, of course, right? Uh, there is the bridge. You can see this one is a tad bit more linear compared to the first uh, analysis option. And it is very, very realistic in terms of the style that it's used. And this is the bridges. Of course, we'll get back to that in part two. Now, I have intentionally added an avoidance zone so that we can actually see the impact. Because the first one that I created, I did not know that the road will probably root both options away from that. I put one right towards the end. So in case you think I'm dodging the actual analysis, let's have a look and see what happens. So intentionally, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do it in this proposal so that it keeps the original road that we have created and we can gauge the difference much more better. So again, I am going to run the same tool for the corridor optimization. And here we are, same story, nothing's different here. Same with the data sources, all of that. I will just close that to make it a bit bigger. And I will just rename this so I know that it's the second avoidance that we are running. Everything else stays the same. I'm going to use the same path, start and end, and I can just hit optimize. You can see that the previous road is there. I'm leaving, leaving it there intentionally. Okay. And we are going to define another avoidance zone right at towards the end. So let's see if it pushes the road or the initial bridge out of the way. Okay, so we're putting it to the test here and we go to avoidance zones and we are going to draw that. So I'm going to make it maybe somewhere here. Right, so let's just draw a big polyline. Right, so you can see there's, you really have to swerve the road away from that area, especially if the ending of the road the end point of the road is that close. Okay, so we create the avoidance zone, we run optimize, and let's see what the result is. So let's go have a look at the PDF that we would normally get by email. And let's see the, I'm just gonna look at the main image. Here we are, as you can see, it actually moved the road, right? The initial part, it has moved it and it is avoiding that red portion. Where previously it went straight through it, as you can see, that's why I left the first road there. You can see the first road is actually going directly through that. And the second one has automatically avoided that area. This is a really, really awesome tool, people. I'm, I'm really like excited about it, but you can see how powerful it is. I did not have to do anything. I just had to define the road, create the avoidance zones, and software uses the intelligence and puts it for. So that is the first option that we would use for our road design. I hope that it is really impressive as it is to me. Let's look at some of the intelligent features that we can use. So here we are at the end of the road, maybe it's towards the linkage area where that road is gonna link to a further road network. So I've just dropped these roads in quite quickly. And we're going to look at how we can intelligently, sorry about that, uh, design this. Here we are. Uh, depending on the design vehicle that you use, it automatically adjusts the geometry. If you would want to adjust the grips, you can actually input your exact radius if needed, and it will update dynamically. This is what I mean by dynamic nature of design, where everything updates instantaneously. Okay. 
What if you wanted to drop in a roundabout? I got quite a few of these requests as well. You could just switch it to a roundabout tool. And here we are. It looks a bit like an UFO. That's quite a big one. Uh, but we can always stretch it. We can edit the parameters based on the design parameters that are already built in, in terms of the standards. If you use vehicle tracking, you should be quite familiar with that. But here we are. You can see it has updated uh, the bottom left curve is a bit uh, finicky because the circle is quite big. You can see it's a slight bulge there. So it shows you that it has updated. Now, we've got the asset card on the right hand side of the metadata if needed, but you can also shorten the approaches. So it gives you a quite an insightful process for design. And again, just to think that this is a conceptual design tool is just mind blowing. Now, I want you to keep in the back of your head that you still have to pitch this design and how you would have done this using your normal 2D conventional tools or your normal CAD tools. It's going to be very difficult to understand this if you're going to be looking at plan views, long sections, those type of things, if you are a non-technical person, if you're not an engineer. Okay. As you can see, I can always update it depending on the design standard that I would like. That one looks a bit more better, more suitable for this. However, I would like to switch back to the intersection because I think uh, based on the area that I'm going to be designing it for, an intersection will be much more suitable. So all I'm going to do is switch back and our design is that. So you can see how much of intelligence you have simply designing. Now we have been finished with the initial road design. So that is our option one. It does need a further tweaking, just a little bit. You will see that in part two, but already you can see the intelligence and the time saving that it's already giving you. Let's go to something a bit more not covered in webinars, which is railway. Option two is going to be a rail. So we all know that grades are absolutely critical for rail design, okay? So we're not gonna go over mountain, I mean, no. All I'm gonna do is switch to my option two. So again, it's still the same model and we are winning already. We didn't have to copy, duplicate, delete, those type of things. I just had to switch a proposal and it's all in the same model with the same intelligence attached. Now, in this case, I am going to plot the route that I want. I'm not gonna use a corridor optimization. I'm gonna go straight to the railway design and I'm going to drop in my part. Okay, so of course, again, zooming is very important. I will just get it relatively for just this example, but it snapped in correctly. And we're gonna say, I want the railway to start at the yellow pin and go directly to the green pin. So again, we will just skydive a little bit, zoom into where we would like it to end. Okay, this is just an example to show you that you can do more than just roads in one application, in one model. And with two clicks, my road is, my rail rather, is complete. Let's go have a look. Here we are. Look how fantastic that looks. You can see the ballast, the sleepers. I mean, look at that. Really, really amazing. If you wanted to create a double track, it is also quite easy. You can always change the styling as to your requirements if needed. You can see there's also styles for bridges and tunnels, those type of things. I've covered this in previous webinars. You're more than welcome to catch them on our YouTube channel. But in this case, I will just leave it for one. Uh, maybe for part two, I will just upgrade it to a two-way railway which is a bit of an over-design or overkill for this type of application, but let's see how it goes. But as you can see, the grading transitions are done. The rail elements are already complete, and you can see it's actually cutting through that mountain. Let's zoom in, let's have a look. It's actually disappearing there, okay? Because as you can see, it's cutting through that quite a bit, and I'm sure you are following my thought pattern here. This one brings us to actually part two soon, where we're gonna be dropping in a tunnel for that, because you don't wanna excav excavate that and leave it open. People are gonna be <laughs> falling in or something's gonna happen, right? Not safe at all. But here we are, we've got the starting end point of our rail, as you can see on the 
the screen. Now, what else can we do? We can leverage objects within the influence library to add some customization for our pitching. So let's have a look. So as you can see, we've got our road. I would do it for a road for this one. So let's say we've got structures, we've got drainages that we can actually add. The one that I'm interested in is the actual environment tab. Now we can go and add city furniture, linear decorations, rows of trees. You can get really, really creative here. Yeah? If you watch my civil collaboration series previously, you would have seen how much of detail we can add to a model. You can see there's even people there, right? So what I will do, I want to add maybe some different type of models. Let's make this a bit bigger so we could preview the thumbnails a bit better. And you can see there is a ton load of objects already pre-built into this. Okay, so you do, I'm showing you all of out of the box features. There's no customization from my side. Whatever you're seeing here is exactly out of the box for influence. Now, let's close that. What I want to do is I don't want to use those lights, right? In South Africa, we don't really use those. Uh, maybe more in the urban areas, if you have certain light ways, you might use something that's targeted towards that type of a uh, styling. I'm going to delete it off. And I'm going to put our typical type of light post. I could put it on the median if I wanted to, but in this case, I want it on either side of the road. So where do we leverage that data? Okay, so all I'm going to do is select the road. You can see already that white text that you're seeing in the air is actually elevation points. Now, I will go and select the option where I want to insert it. So you can see this is the latest enhancement in InfoWorks 22. Really cool. It gives you the output in like an orange line. And you don't have to wait for your model to load that long. And as you can see, just with a single click, I put in my posts, but they are facing in the wrong direction. Now, if you do get this, don't freak out. You can always adjust the orientation. No, you would not find it in the road asset card, right? As you can see, these are all road orientated uh, metadata, but you would need to click on the light pole itself, right? So if you're gonna be scrolling up and down, as I've heard from a lot of users, you won't find it there, okay? So let's go and select the light posts. And now you see all of the metadata is there. We can adjust the spacing, the height, all of those things. I'm gonna just adjust the orientation to 180 degrees. And here we are, facing the correct way. Simple and easy with just a few clicks. And you can see we are in the roadway. We've got all of our other data that's already still there. So just to show you that all of the options that we had done previously, are still there, as you can see here. So none of the data is deleted, it's rather retained into one model, okay? And you can see the avoidance zones, you can actually customize that if needed, if you wanted to change it to different colors, or you wanted to change it to different types of coverages, right? So we call them zoning in design. You can actually use those depending on your color preferences. You can also change it to materials, uh, you can go to your material groups, or you could use a simple color. That's what's been applied here. Okay. You can also add like water areas, culverts, like fence and barriers. All of this is pre-built into the software as well as land cover. So let's say this was a type of vegetation that I needed to avoid. All right. So let's maybe use, let's see which one will look quite interesting. I don't think that one. Let's see city block. No, that is more for paving. Let's see. No, that's definitely not going to be it. Uh, so you can see, like, you can toggle through different options and see which one's going to suit you better. Let's check terrain. Uh, let's see. Let's use. Let's use forest ground. Okay. So all I got to do is select it and hit OK. Click in my model, so it will just regenerate in a few seconds. So let's give it a few seconds. And that red now has been updated by a vegetation coverage or a forest type of style. Let's zoom in. Now it's cool with this dynamic nature is that the closer you zoom in, the more detail it gets. And you can see, I hope you can see the resolution as good as I can on my screen. If not, when you're using it, you can actually see how realistic this looks. 
So customization is quite easy in InfraWorks. Um, it doesn't work only on elements of parametric nature, but also on coverages. We are coming to the home run of the webinar where we're going to look at uh, creating a model snapshot, right? I have done the videos one previously, but maybe in part two, I will slot it in. So let's go to real. So first of all, you would need to apply your creative nature here in terms of your angles. Uh, unleash your inner photographer, right? Uh, so maybe I'm happy with this angle. All I've got to do is go to the create snapshot button. It's as simple as that. Right. We don't have to use a slip and sketch or whatever print screen. We can actually use it however we'd like from directly in the platform. So I'm going to drop this on my desktop, as you can see there. And I could either adjust the resolution so I can go up to 4K, right? So if you are a lucky one and you've got a 4K monitor, you could actually get that. I'm going to use my viewport resolution, which is pretty good. And I'm going to hit save. And once we do that, I'm just going to drag that image from my other screen quite quickly. Just give me a second. Here we are. And look how good that looks. OK, so you can get high quality, high res imagery directly from the application without using like print screen or screen grab or all of the other tools that we would normally use. The video type of it or presentation, I have done a webinar on it using the storyboard. But we'll see, maybe I would be nice and cover it in part two a little bit. And that's about it for this webinar. So let's look at the closing and key takeaways. So we used the road corridor optimization and we actually used three optioneering methods. One was get us from point A to point B, so start point to end. The second one was an avoidance zone that didn't really impact us. It was right on top of the mountain. And we put a second avoidance zone at the end. So the road actually had to divert or swerve around it in order to maintain our design spec. We did apply intelligent road features for the intersections and roundabouts. We created a real way simply by using two clicks. And we also leveraged the objects from the InfraWorks library out of the box. Okay, we inserted those light posts and of course we updated the coverage. We did a quick snapshot of the model. Again, you could do as many as you'd like, really uh, make your presentations pop, your reports that much better. And of course, you could go the extra mile and also do like fly throughs and stuff like that for your videos. And last but not least, part two will be a continuation of the same model. So I'm keeping the continuity here and we're gonna focus more on the bridges and tunnels. So I will delete the bridges that have been automated and show you how you could insert it at the places you would like. So you definitely don't want to miss it, especially for the tunnels. So how can we help you as Baker Mains? As you've seen earlier in the presentation, we've had, we help a lot of consultants help design and make a better world. Uh, HHO was this case in terms of the feature that we use. But if you go onto the customer success stories uh, website and audit us, there are quite a lot that we've done in South Africa. Conco being one of them, Lombard Consulting Engineers. Have a look at it. I mean, South Africa, we are using it, so don't think that it's not within our grasp. How we do this with our consultants is, of course, we use a unique methodology, consulting methodology that's to us. It's I Adopt, where we help you to assess your current needs, we educate you, where we live with this philosophy that we teach you to fish rather than you dependent on us. But if it's out of your depth or you need some guidance, we a bulk of our business model is actually consulting. So we helped a lot of engineers, architects, um, electrical, mechanical, a lot of uh, design across the spectrum to design and make a better world and be more intelligent and innovative. If you want to follow us, which I strongly recommend, which most of you are, uh, that are all our handles on Baker Baines. So you can reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Like I said, please subscribe. Uh, you can also drop us an email, info at bakerbaines.com. And we've got two main offices, one being in Cape Town and here in Gauteng, uh, Sunning Hill. Um, and of course, our clients, whoever are subscribed to us or our users, we have post a support desk that's open from Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. right up to half past 11 at night. So if you're stuck, we've got your back during those times. And of course, 
our support email is on your screen. So let's open it up for Q&A. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, those are all of the segments that I actually serve. A lot of technology, as you can see on the screen. So I have a lot of requests for this to show exactly how do I know which software applications you can help me with. Now you've got the logos there, so I think it's pretty clear. Right, so primary segment is more on civil infrastructure, secondary more on the builds type of things. Other technologies on VR, upskilling, IDAS, uh, ArcGIS, which is the new one, and of course, uh, virtual reality. And how I can help you from a design perspective as well as from a company perspective, consulting, software training, scan to burn, process analysis, demos, if you need to see how the software works, we can always set that up. Presenting, if you'd like us to present at your events or anything like that, you can always reach out. Webinars, like what you're seeing here. And if you're just working on something really cool or you just want to chat, you can always hit me up on LinkedIn. So let's open up the floors for Q&A. I would really like to hear your comments. Uh, please fire away in the chat box if you have any questions. If you don't have any questions or just comments, you're more than welcome to actually shoot away. So I'll give it a few seconds. Uh, in the meantime, I will see if there has been any questions so long. Okay, here's one question here, which I didn't expect. What is the difference between profile and corridor optimization? Good question. Uh, as you've seen in my previous webinars, we have used that. The profile works on the vertical alignment itself. Okay, so you've defined the road, you want to actually optimize the profile, whereas the corridor, it actually does the actual routing for you, as you've seen here. Uh, it's a bit confusing in terms of terminology or wording, but uh, I think if you do it, you will understand much more better. Okay, another one. Uh, can you compute earthworks? Yes. That is like mind-blowing in a conceptual design tool. Right, so you can get the prelim or conceptual design quantities here in InfraWorks. Cut and fill, you could export it to Excel, you could work with that if you want to do like a prelim cost. That's why we had those metadata options to add those costing factors to the corridor optimization. So the more time you spend in inputting those the more value you're going to see in that PDF reports and stuff like that that you have generated. So again, good question there. Okay, let me keep scrolling here. I've got another one which is more or less similar to that one. Okay, I've got one here. Do you have a workaround to bring property sets from solids from civil 3D to InfraWix. So how does this work? Generally, when you're exporting, depending on your method of exporting, the property sets should come through, okay? Because civil 3D can be imported directly into InfraWix, uh, the metadata should come aligned or attached to that. So maybe just check on the way that you're importing it. I'm not sure what type of solid you're using, but generally the parametric nature of the element should come through. That's why uh, bridges are actually done in InfraWorks because all of that metadata does come through. So maybe check on how your formatting is done, how your export is done from civil 3D. Uh, generally, there's not much of an export because there's a, under the data source pattern in InfraWorks, you can bring in a civil 3D model directly. And also in InfraWorks, you can simply go to the insert tab and use the InfraWorks button for that. So give that a shot. Um, if you don't come right, you've got my contact details. Uh, you can reach us out on the company and we can have a look for you, no problem. And there's another one here regarding GIS. What type of file formats are compatible? So the two, well, the most common file format is a shape file. Okay, so .shp, that is worldwide standard, popularly used by ISVI. ISVI is the global leader in GIS, and shape format can be imported directly into InfraWorks as well as into Civil 3D. Autodesk also has a really cool format that has more than just linear items. It's called an SDF format. That format also can be brought into here directly where you can combine different data sets in there. 
I hope that helps. Um, where it can be very valuable is where you've got plots or earths or uh, property extends, right? So this is how you can do this. Is it possible to share the presentation for future, future reference? Yes. Uh, as I said in the beginning of the webinar, uh, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which you can make as much reference as you like. You can also share it with your colleagues, which couldn't attend today for some reason. So as long as you're registered for this webinars or any of our future webinars, even if you can't make it, you will be sent a notification to say once this presentation has been uploaded to YouTube. So please, if you do see our webinars, whether it be in architecture, whether it be in mechanical, whether it be here in civil infrastructure, if for some reason you can't attend that allocated time, register anyway. You would get a notification to say once the recording is uploaded, and then you can go watch it at your own leisure. Okay, let's see if I have missed anything else. When will part two be? <laughs> uh, okay, it should be next month. Uh, the date has slipped my memory. I think it is the 30th, right? Don't hold me to that. Uh, you will see a post for it, of course, on LinkedIn, as well as from our mailers that you will receive the invites from. It is going to be really cool. Uh, just some heads up that I'm gonna do something really fancy on the bridge part of things to show you that you could actually do stunning presentations on here that are very, very, very realistic. So the stuff that you would normally see like in Dubai or like, you know, those fancy videos that you would normally see that, oh, wow, you can actually do it in this application, right? But that's it. You guys are squeezing information out of me a bit too much here. Yeah? Uh, but yeah, we'll wait for that. Okay, I think that's about it. I think I've got through all of the questions. Again, I'll just put the slide up if you want to reach out to me. My email address is on there. Thank you very much for attending to this webinar. I think it was really cool. I hope it benefited you quite well to show you that no matter how complex your design gets, you can really, really, really make it look that much more cooler. Okay, much more realistic and those type of things, okay? All right, so thank you very much. Have an awesome day, have an awesome weekend, and I will catch you all for part two soon. Bye, everyone.